Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of How I Teach with the Language Arts Lady. I'm Donna Reesh, your teacher, your hostess, and hopefully your friend. So I'm excited today to bring you more information about sentence writing versus clause writing versus phrase writing. So before we get too far into the content today, I want to remind you that every hit episode comes with its own teacher's notebook. And it looks like this. Let's see how to scroll on here. Looks like this. And it has the lesson that I'm teaching from for you. So uh, typically it is a writing lesson and you can use it to teach writing to your students. This is more of an upper level, so more a high school level um, workbook text that you can go review with your student, have him or her listen to them, listen to this assignment, listen to this uh, podcast episode and the previous one and learn all about it themselves. So this is not actually a worksheet uh, like most of them are. This is a little bit different. This comes from my Write Write Quick Kit, which is a training kit um, that is four and a half hours long of video training with a 100 page book. And so you can uh, get that at my Teachers Pay Teacher store. And then you will have access to all four and a half hours of the, the videos that go with it. And you can use that for your own um, teaching uh, information, or you can use it also with your students, with your classroom, however it fits. Um, definitely appropriate for I'd say seventh or eighth grade and above. So anyway, this is your teacher's notebook, so be sure to grab that. All right, I'm gonna head right on over to the PowerPoint now and start today's lesson. Here we go. So How I Teach had been a weekly publication broadcast. Remember, it is available on video and audio, and every episode has the teacher's notebook. So this is episode 52, which means there are 52 different lessons. 52 different teacher's notebooks that are completely free for you to get at the languageartsladyblog.com. Um, now I'm uh, switching over to some more short form content. So this will be a monthly uh, broadcast and it'll drop the first of each month. So the first of each month, you will have access to a new free lesson, a new uh, free teacher's notebook and uh, to use with your students. And the lesson span from, well, I have some, um, preschool, kindergarten, uh, beginning reading things all the way up to 12th grade. The bulk of my writing books, uh, 100 books, 50,000 pages plus, that is those fall between second grade and 12th grade. So there are things for every single level. So you can literally get a lesson for any level that you want if you go over to the teacher's notebook and grab those. And then you can also see how I teach it through the video that accompanies it. All right. So then in addition to the long form, how I teach uh, next week, the first week of July, you will see something new dropping if you are on iTunes or if you follow on the blog or if you follow at YouTube and that is 10 minute grammar. So I will be doing a weekly podcast, which will also be up at YouTube as a video as well. And it will also be at IG Instagram. And that will be 10 minutes of grammar slash writing teaching in more of a short form type of content, tent, more conversational. I'm really excited about that. I love, love, love talking about grammar, language arts, writing, you know the drill. All right, so here we go. This is part two of two, it's episode 52, and the title is Sentence Clauses and Phrases. Again, this is from the Write, Write, Quick Kit, which it looks like that on the front, and it is a quick kit of how to teach writing from words to phrases, to clauses, to sentences, to paragraphs, to multi-paragraphs with, um, as I said, four and a half hours worth of videos and a hundred page book. And that is available at my store. All right, so last time, part one of this, we focused on um, uh, paragraph, part two here, uh, sentences and unsentences. We focused on sentences versus clauses versus phrases. Um, we uh, only really got through the subordinate clause information. So I'm going to kind of scroll through that and remind you kind of about what we had last time uh, to prepare you for today's uh, phrases lessons. So we talked about last time the five parts of a sentence, and um, this is available as a poster 
um, at Teachers Pay Teachers, my Teachers Pay Teachers store, caves, capital, all make sense, verb, in mark, subject. All of my posters also um, have what is called reference rings cards. And the reference ring cards are little um, one quarter of an eight and a half by 11 sheet that you can print on tag board and punch a hole in the corner, put it on a ring, and it has all of the poster information on cards. It's really, really handy um, to have your students have this at their fingertips as well. So that caves poster and reference ring set is available at Teachers Pay, my Teachers Pay Teacher store. Okay, so then we talked about a subordinate clause versus a sentence. You may remember from your school days, and depending on what program you use now, you may remember that uh, a sentence is a clause. And that is really confusing to students when you try to say there's a dependent clause, there's an independent clause. There is a uh, uh, um, subordinate clause, which is dependent, and then there is a, an independent clause or a sentence. And so those kind of all get lumped together. So I'm very careful in my wording to either say sentences or subordinate clauses. And then I say, remember, a subordinate clause is subordinate to the rest of the sentence. It's not a real sentence by itself. And a subordinate clause is dependent upon something else. So I just remember in school, it was independent clause and dependent clause. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I even understood what that meant. <laughs> and so again, the terminology is important. It's important what we say to students when we are teaching them, the wording, the phrasing, so that they can get it in their minds and it can cement learning and it can become part of their memory because then they can apply it to writing. All right, so we did a lot with this um, last month. Uh, first six subordinators learned in rhyme. The, all the subordinator teaching um, as far as memorizing and the preposition, preposition teaching, all 230 prepositional phrases is also, uh, those are both also available at my Teachers Pay Teacher store in my Think Fast, quick, uh, think fast Grammar quizzes. All right, um, and those are quizzes that I do every um, week with my students to make sure that they know all the subordinate clauses, all, I mean, all the subordinators, all the prepositions, all the interjections, all of the uh, coordinated conjunctions, um, all the be a helper link verbs, all that. It's just a quick, quick, um, that's why it's called Think Fast Grammar Quiz. And I also have a hit episode about how to use those. All right. So when we look at the difference between a subordinate clause and a sentence, we're talking about a group of words that has a subject and verb, both sets, whether it's a subordinate clause or it's a sentence. They both have a subject and a verb in them. The difference is that a subordinate clause has a subordinator at the beginning of it. And that's why it's so important that our students know since, when, though, because if, although, when, whenever, what, whatever, who, whoever, whom, whomever, when, whenever, where, wherever, right? So that they know what fits right in here makes it not be a sentence, right? How many times do we have elementary kids who write a sentence that they write, you know, when my dog got out of his fence, period. And then they go on, he ran down the street, right? Because they don't understand that that subordinator, that when at the beginning of it makes it be a not real sentence. It makes it not real anymore. All right, so you can go back and do all of episode 51 for the whole lesson on subordinate clauses versus sentences. But for our purposes here, moving into phrases today, I wanna to be sure that we understand that, a, that they're both clauses, independent clauses and dependent clauses, sentences, and subordinate clauses. And they both have a subject, they both have a verb, but they both cannot stand alone. And so that is going to be the difference. And that also takes us to the difference between a subordinate clause and a prepositional phrase. So let's move there. <clears throat> All right. So um, there are many reasons to learn prepositions. And that's why I have, um, I don't know, maybe five preposition products at my Teachers Pay Teacher store, including this most darling bugs on the log for elementary students. But, and, and these are some of the reasons, and these are some of the things that make it crucial that our students know 100 plus prepositions and that they can recognize prepositional phrases where they begin and where they end. So we learn prepositions in order to distinguish between a real sentence and a non-sentence. 
right? Just like with subordinators, we learn those so that we know that when my dog got out of his cage, his fence period is not a sentence, right? That, that learning those key words will, will clue the students into, oh, this isn't a real sentence. All right, and then we also learn prepositions to in order to punctuate sentences containing them because there are various uh, comma rules, right, for punctuating sentences that begin with prepositional phrases of various lengths, uh, sentences that begin with subordinate clauses, period, um, sentences that have prepositional phrases in the middle used as an appositive, um, like uh, the girls along with, along with their brother, comma, um, that would be a prepositional phrase along with their brother would be a type of a positive, right? So we want to know that when a prepositional phrase is used as a positive, it needs commas surrounding it. When a prep sentence begins with a short prepositional phrase, it may or may not need a comma uh, following it. When a sentence begins with a long prepositional phrase or a double prepositional phrase or a confusing prepositional phrase with a date or name or something, uh, it does require a comma following it and so forth. So we learn them so that we can punctuate. Thirdly, we learn them so that we can use the correct pronouns in a sentence. So uh, in the case of um, the boy, comma, along with his sisters, comma, uh, was riding his bike to town. Okay, we don't say were, we don't, that's number four. We don't match the verb uh, with girls because that is a prepositional phrase and our sentence, our subject is not inside of a prepositional phrase 95% of the time. And we don't say their bikes because we're, the prepositional phrase, we're ignoring it, right? And so I know this might sound like a lot and that is why it is really important to do all of this incrementally. We start out teaching bugs on a log you know, these are 30 prepositions with the bug on the log, over the log, under the log, through the log, around the log, and so forth. Then we move into, you know, 50 prepositions. And we, you know, use the uh, beast or beauty in the castle, or we use um, the um, Santa sleigh or an angel at Christmas time around the clouds, or we use um, a plane or a bird around clouds. And we memorize. Then we move from memorization to recognizing, oh wait, there is a preposition. I'll bet this is going to be a prepositional phrase. Oh, what's, what else comes with a prepositional phrase? It's object. Okay, this is where it ends then. Here's the beginning of the prepositional phrase. Here is the end of the prepositional phrase. And then we move into punctuating, then we move into pronouns, and we move into matching the subjects and verbs. And then of course we write with more advanced sentence structures. All right. So the sequence, of course, the, re the reason is that they are found at the beginning of prepositional phrases. The whole crux of prepositional learning is that they are found at the beginning of prepositional phrases. And that's why we want to have students you know, recognize 100 of them if possible. There are 230 plus if you include the multi-word ones, um, like in the middle of, things like that. Um, and then uh, we learn that a prepositional phrase is a phrase that is a group of words. And going back to our subordinate clause, a clause contains a subject and a verb. A phrase does not contain a subject and a verb. So a prepositional phrase is a phrase, which is a group of words that begins with a preposition. All right, so that is, uh, I always do prepositions, prepositional phrases first. It's just for teachers to spell in the other order because it's important for us to learn at the beginning, right early on, why students continually write when my dog got out of the cage, uh, out of the fence, period, right? <laughs> so, um, but with students, we, we take the easiest chunk first, right? And then we move in and, um, and get more information. All right. And the subject of a sentence is seldom found within a prepositional phrase. Um, about 95% of the time, the subject of a sentence will not be in a prepositional phrase. So it's important that students can recognize them, prepositional phrases, and get rid of them mentally and match their subjects with their verbs. And um, 
than that subject verb agreement that the subject verb agreement is one of the biggest writing problems ever because of all the various sentence structures and matching each subject with its correlating verb. Because obviously a sentence can have its main subject and its main verb, but then it might have other subjects and other verbs like we learned last week in episode 51 with subordinate clauses. You could, or compound sentences, compound complex sentences. You could literally have half dozen or more uh, subjects that need to correlate with a verb somehow, right? And so that is why uh, the sequence, the reasoning behind learning prepositions. All right, so let me give you some examples that you can see because I've been kind of giving some verbal ones, but uh, the, these three show you uh, a really some really good examples of this and why students need to be able to put parentheses around prepositional phrases. At first, that's what we do, and then eventually they can mentally delete them, right? But at first, that's not something that's easy to do. You can't, there's, there are too many moving parts. There are too many things going on for us to give a student a sentence, the boy in the stories was lost, and for the student to say, okay, in is a preposition, in what? In the stories, in the stories is a prepositional phrase. I'm gonna ignore that, so now I'm gonna go back. Okay, the boy, boy, okay, now I need to skip over that in the stories was, all right, right? So many moving parts. So we are going to have them isolate prepositional phrases with parentheses. And in that case, they need to recognize the preposition in. They need to be able to say in what, or in where, or in whom. That's how I teach prepositional phrases, the, that the object answers the question of the position, or in the case of time, of the time. All right, and then, um, we put parentheses around it, and then we have the subject left and the verb left, uh, at least the main verb of the sentence. So in number one, the boy in the stories was lost. In what? In the stories, put parentheses around it. The boy was. If they do not isolate prepositional phrases with parentheses, the word that is closest to the verb is the word stories. And it doesn't even sound that terrible to say in the, boys, the boy in the stories were lost because stories is right up against the verb. So it doesn't even sound awful to do it. It actually doesn't even sound incorrect. Now, it does to me because I spend my entire life putting parentheses around prepositional phrases in students' papers to show them how they need to match their subjects and verbs <laughs> in all their papers everywhere. Um, but to most people, I mean, even, you know, fairly grammar savvy people, the boy in the stories were lost doesn't really sound terrible. and and. It shouldn't because stories is right up against the verb. So we isolate that and then we realize a real subject of the sentence is not stories because the subject is seldom in a prepositional phrase. Instead, the subject of that sentence is boy. And, and then I always do this test with my kids. It's the, um, the subject verb agreement test. It is an it or a they. Is a boy an it or a he or she? Is the boy an it or a he or a she? I'll say he. Okay, so do you say he was or he were? He was, boom. Next one, number two. On the outskirts of town, a little house fell down. Now I don't do that all at once. Those are a lot of different tricks that we use, right? So eventually, but I can do that all the time with my students. I can say, okay, uh, magazines, magazines, is that an it or a they? They, if you want they is or they are, are, right. Okay, so we need they are, we need they were, we need um, they, um, uh, run, whatever it might be. It's just uh, the series, the sequence that I follow in um, calling out the singular versus the plural. And number two, on the outskirts of town, that's a double prepositional phrase opener. And um, it, the first one is on, on what? On the outskirts. The next one is of, of what? Of town. And then you have your real sentence. I always tell, teach students, especially young students, that your real sentence starts after the openers, right? Um, we call it real in that case. <laughs> Just makes it a lot easier than saying your um, independent clause starts where, right? Let's not say that to third graders. Let's say your real sentence starts right here. A little house, a little house, is a little house an it or a they? It's an it, it fell, right? All right, and then of course we have our comma rule that comes into play um, to 
um, with that. And then there's the, the, the debates, of course, whether we just say house or we say little house or we say a little house as a main subject. And um, that's debatable, right? <laughs> I mean, you're gonna find it in grammar books in various ways. I tell my students that if it doesn't change the, um, the subject, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a big house, a little house, a house, the house, it's a singular house, right? And they can either say a little house or they can say house. All right, the number three is the blonde girl. Again, everything we teach in grammar should focus towards writing. It should all point to writing or speaking. The blonde girl, parentheses, out of all the girls was on key. We have two prepositional phrases. We have one that begins with the prepositional, uh, compound preposition out of, and that prepositional phrase says out of who, out of what, or out of whom, out of all the girls. Okay, that's where that ends. The next one is on, on what, on key. I'm gonna isolate those and that leaves us with the blonde girl. Is girl, she or a they? She, she was, the girl was. All right, again, girls is up against, the plural girls in the prepositional phrase is up against the verb. So the blonde girl out of all the girls were on key. It doesn't even sound terrible. It does to me, but it doesn't sound that bad, right? Because girls is right up against the verb. So it makes sense that you would think it was girls were. And this is the, one of the biggest reasons. And whenever my students uh, make this error and I point it out, I say, I always say, this is the reason. This is the reason. I want them to know there's a reason that we work so hard on these uh, elements that contribute to subject verb agreement. All right. So I teach them, as I said, prepositions, I teach them with tricks, right? I teach them with uh, what we call our preposition practice pal. In the case of the bugs on the log uh, program, that's at, that's at my teacher's pay teacher store. We teach with ladybugs and logs. Super cute. Oh my goodness gracious. My um, designer is so good. <laughs> it's, so, it's so stinking cute. Um, and then we move on to the birdie and the plane or uh, the birdie or the plane and the clouds or the beast or the beauty in the castle or Santa, reindeers, elves, angels in the clouds at Christmas. I have uh, uh, several. And we know that 90% of the words that fit in the preposition check sentence will be prepositions. So now, before you say, what about, what about adverbs? It doesn't really make sense if you put an adverb there. So if you say the plane flew quickly, the clouds, it doesn't really make sense. The plane flew, flew carefully, the clouds, doesn't really make sense. The plane flew loudly, the clouds, doesn't really make sense. So about 90% of the position prepositions. And um, I should back up and say, we first of all say preposition show position, okay? That's what we say first, preposition show position. So, um, so we can just go through this check sentence and they can literally learn 100 prepositions from nothing more than this. The plane flew, let me see what's on the next page. I can give you a hundred, but let me just see the list. There we go. About aboard the clouds, about the clouds, above the clouds, around the clouds, across the clouds, beneath the clouds, below the clouds, atop the clouds, between the clouds, beyond the clouds, by the clouds, close to the clouds, down the clouds, far from the clouds, from the clouds, following the clouds, inside the clouds, inside of the clouds, in between the clouds, in place of the clouds, in addition to the clouds, in back of the clouds, into the clouds, minus the clouds, near the clouds, on top of the clouds, opposite of the clouds, out of the clouds, out from the clouds, outside the clouds, past the clouds, round the clouds, through the clouds, throughout the clouds, towards it, so on and so forth. So many. This, the, the jingles, the rhymes, the songs, I do all of those. I have a be a helper link verb song, 36 BHL verbs, being helping a link verbs, boom, 36 of them. I have, um, um, uh, the uh, my well oh well yes no rhyme for interjections. I have the um, six subordinators learned in rhyme since when though because if although. But song and jingles can be limiting. 
So I use those when they are not limiting. So like the first, the six interjections or you know whatever the case may be in the different rhymes are in my Think Fast Grammar quizzes. Um, but once, if I did use a song for prepositions, which I learned them kind of in a sing song manner, I remember, you know, aboard, about, above, beyond, beneath, between, and, and I have kids all the time who come and they know that song. And I'm always like, that is so great, you guys, you know, 30 of them already. This check sentence is going to help you learn 70 more so that you can get a whole repertoire of 100 prepositions so that you can always spot your prepositional phrases. So, you know, I would say start if you're program uses a song, start out with the song, but the beauty of the check sentence, both for the preposition and last month's subordinate clause check sentence, the beauty of it, is, the, both of those is that they teach the purpose, and that is to create subordinate clauses in the case of subordinators, to create prepositional phrases in the case of prepositions. All right, so then we have a time one, and these are much more limited. We don't have as many time ones as many time prepositions as we do spatial. But we, the boy, boy played after the classes, Santa laughed after the dinner, um, Birdie smiled after the picnic. I can't, I, I can't remember what all, I, what all they are in all my different programs. But at any rate, um, that, that'll help them learn the time ones. And then we have the next problem which is our final problem for today. And that is the subordinate clause versus the phrase. So remember, sentences and subordinate clauses both have subjects and verbs. A phrase does not have. Now we have all kinds of other problems like uh, in keeping the faith. Well, that's got a verb in it. Is that a prepositional phrase? And so then I'll tell my students, you know, that's kind of a prepositional clause. Let's go ahead and mark it. It has a verb in it, but it doesn't have a subject and verb, right? So it's not going to throw us off. It doesn't have both. And then a sentence can stand alone. Phrase never stands alone. A subordinate clause has a subject near the beginning of it. Well, so does a sentence, but near the beginning of it. And a phrase has an object near the end of it. All right. I would really love to invite you to subscribe to 10 Minute Grammar. It will be up the first week of July, 10 fast, fast grammar, language arts, writing, vocabulary, spelling tips that um, will just further remind you of all the things that are in your uh, curricula that you use with your students and all the things that you've taught them in the past. Uh, maybe bring some new points up um, because I'm always learning. I read for study grammar every single day. <laughs> That's how much I love it. Um, so I would love to have you join me and you can get on the mailing list at languageartsblog.com. You get 18 free teaching products if you do, including videos with me teaching your students and writing books and all kinds of things. Um, subscribe at iTunes to 10 Minute Grammar and it'll come in your iTunes feed every week. And um, subscribe to Language Arts Lady YouTube and it will come in your YouTube feed and follow me on IG. On Instagram, I'm going to be putting those recordings there as well as doing some reels about, short reels about the longer content. So it's short content, but reels are even shorter. So anyway, follow me there and let's get uh, excited about teaching grammar and teaching writing. And um, let's get our students excited about learning it as well. All right, here's some free products kind of related to this. It was, it was a little bit different um, because it wasn't a writing assignment, but here are some free writing assignments that you can grab uh, in my 18 freebies. And also this uh, hit number 49 has a free preposition list and preposition category cards for your students. So it's got the whole list of all 235 prepositions and it has them broken down by... Um, uh, alphabetical, so all the A's, B's, so forth, all the vowels, all the U's, all the all the T's. It has them broken down by synonyms. It has them broken down by antonyms. It has them broken down by multi words. It is a an amazing, amazing free product. And then it has those things also. All the categories 
that I just mentioned are on little index cards for your students to have the categories in front of them too. I always put my categories up on the board when my kids are first learning prepositions and I'll say, I could go through all your categories, do your check sentence, then go, your, go to your A's, then go to your vowels, then go to your B's, then go to your I's, so forth, um, so that they have the categories in front of them. What are opposites of the ones you have listed already? What are synonyms of the ones you have listed already? So those category, category cards are invaluable. All right, and um, here are some, okay, here are some other digital products. These are the things that I mentioned during this episode. So the caves posters, the bugs on the log, beauty and the beast preposition, uh, general preposition practice with the birdie or the plane and the clouds, um, think fast grammar quizzes, the beginning one and the advanced one, those are all available at my Teachers Pay Teacher store. And uh, there are some more um, essay and story writing lessons that are available at Language Arts Lady store as well as um, Teachers Pay Teachers. And my semester long faith-based composition books. So these are writing books for one semester that are faith-based. Uh, they have some of the fairy tales and things as well as godly heroes and animals and things like that. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me and I will see you next month on hit number 53, but hopefully I'll see you before that in the 10 minute grammar or Instagram or someplace else of the many places I'm hanging out this summer. Thanks again.